Good evening. On behalf of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum, a component of the National Archives and Records Administration, it is my pleasure to welcome you to lecture number six of the Becoming America Lecture Series. Dr. Joellen Chatham, Director of the Center for Civics Education at Concordia University in Irvine, she and her colleagues have worked tirelessly to craft an educational and entertaining lecture series. The lecture series will last 45 minutes with a question and answer format following. So if you have any questions, please email me at craig.ellefson at nara.gov, C-R-A-I-G dot E-L-L-E-F-S-O-N at N-A-R-A dot gov. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Joellen Chatham. Thank you, and once again, we would like to appreciate and thank very much the staff at the National Archives here at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. The last six weeks, we have talked about all the foundational history, the roots of the American political system, our Declaration of Independence, and the beginnings of the Constitution. Beginning this evening, and for the next five weeks after this, we're going to take a deep dive into the Constitution itself, in the following six weeks, we'll do the same with the Bill of Rights. This evening, our initial discussion about the Constitution has a rather unique title. It's the Constitution is the law of the land until it isn't. And our guest lecture this evening, we've had her here before, is Lisa Matthews. Uh, Lisa is working on her doctorate at the Claremont Graduate School with a very intriguing title, Morning at Mount Vernon. Not morning as in the sunrise, but morning as in we have lost someone and we're mourning. And it's really a study of the early history of Mount Vernon as a historical site. She's also been a uh, adjunct professor at Concordia University and is currently teaching at several colleges and universities in Southern California. So please help me welcome again, Lisa Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Chatham. And thank you for allowing me to come before you again tonight to continue discussing the documents that made America. For the past few weeks, this series has tried to examine the complex ideas that led to the Declaration of Independence and the creation of the Constitution. At the end of the 18th century, this was a difficult and messy process, a difficult and messy process that's still ongoing. In future weeks, the series will examine, as you've heard, the three branches of government, the addition of the Bill of Rights. But for tonight, I want to break from the early republic and move through the series of events that challenged Americans to consider the proper role of the state and national government. The roles that have been in place had a great deal of controversy surrounding them over the last two centuries. And we still argue about the division of power between the local and federal governments today. The roots of our current thinking about the supremacy of the Constitution take us to the founding. However, to begin, I want to examine the concept of shared powers in the state and national governments defined as federalism. Federalism is a form of government in which the central power shares or divides authority with regional governmental powers. This system, as understood by political thinkers of the 18th century, had been employed by ancient empires to administer holdings in far-flung regions under their control. And it was hardly a new concept. By the time the creators of the U.S. Constitution met, a form of this system had been in place in the pre-Revolution America under British policies before the Seven Years' War, and then used by the Articles of Confederation government to unite the 13 colonies during the war. Each state was responsible for administering laws and keeping local order. This system gave states sovereignty over their local issues, but states united together against their common enemy of Britain in the prosecution of the war. What developed in the new conceptualization of federalism under the Constitution was a democratic version of shared powers. Unlike prior rule by political elites, which then filtered to the populace, the new government would seek out the consent of the people to justify and ordain their existence. 
in outlining a, pro outlining a process of ratification originating from the state legislatures rather than the convention delegates, the people of the states had a say over whether the Constitution would become the law of the land. This early form of popular sovereignty would change the relationship between the government and the people. But it also would reshape the way people viewed the government and their role in a united system. This was a unique aspect at the time. The new federalism of the US Constitution attempted to correct the weak central government of the Articles of Confederation. While preventing tyranny, it uh, I'm sorry, while preventing the tyranny they had experienced under the British monarchy. This was a tenuous line to walk in the nascent republic. The previous forms were, in their own ways, opposite sides of the same coin. Would the new nation be too strong or too weak? Should the national government hold the power over the states? Or could the states dictate to the central authority? How would rights be protected and preserved? What is the appropriate relationship between the people and the government? How can changes be made? The founders sought to address these questions. Yet these questions continue to plague political scientists today. The idea of distributing the powers between the two, the national and the local, was deemed the remedy for the disunity that plagued the states after the Constitution. James Madison, chief architect of the Constitution, wrote about that distinction that would exist in the federal system that the new government would create in Federalist 39. As Madison details, the people of each state would elect representatives, giving the people a voice. These representatives would give the democratic representation that had been missing under British rule, while offering a central authority to solve disputes and create the order missing under the Articles. However, the move to democracy within federalism was still challenging. Each state had already formed its unique traditions and their unique laws. The very problem which had led to the instability under the Articles. With each state accustomed to holding sovereignty, how could all these various people with competing ideas come together? The concophony of voices was as complicated then as it is today. Finding the balance between local and national concerns has been a continual battle for Americans. Then, as now, Americans question whether large or small states should be able to dictate the laws of the nation. How could minority voices be added to the discussion? The divide between the large and small states and the problems of factions has never gone away. But for the founders, possible solutions were found in a bicameral legislature, regular elections, the electoral college, and a system of checks and balances between the three branches. And despite these solutions, disagreements remained. To address these fears, the founders created Article 6 of the Constitution. Article 6 makes the United States a sovereign national entity. This article begins with a transfer of all prior commitments of the Confederation government to the new government, exchanging one legitimate government for another. More importantly, in this section of the Constitution, we find the establishment of the Supremacy Clause. The United States dissolving the Confederation through the Constitution becomes the sole and sovereign entity for the new American government. And as written in Article 6, the laws of the United States are the supreme law of the land. This phrase, law of the land, has a long history in English common law originating from the Magna Carta and the ideas of due process. However, it's also rooted in the belief that tradition and legal precedents are part of this process. In establishing that the Constitution is the law of the land in Article 6, the founders shifted the focus from each state's own statutes and laws to a unified national entity, the United States. This was solidified in the next two clauses of Article 6, which declare all state judges are bound to uphold the Constitution as the law of the land, and all senators and representatives are sworn to support this document. With the Constitution placed as supreme, the founders fixed on many of the issues 
from the Articles of Confederation, which had compelled them to meet in the first place. Yet it put the document on very unstable ground. Many of the leaders in the states did not wish to relinquish their powers to a central and possibly tyrannical government. And this would be the crux of the argument between power struggles into the next century. Many issues divided Americans in the period of the early Republic. However, none was more contentious than slavery. This forced labor system was in place in all parts of the early Republic, from the New England states of the North to Georgia in the South and into the Western territories before the passage of the Northwest Ordinance. There was no place in the former British colonies which had not practiced some form of slavery before and after the revolution. And while arguments against the use of slavery existed before the revolution, the abolitionist movement did not begin to gain traction in North America until after the war. For many of the earliest abolitionists, the movement was found in the words of the Declaration of Independence. Citing the ideas of equality, liberty, and freedom, conversations began among Americans about the contradiction between their beliefs and their actions. They debated the meaning of their fight for liberty and self-governance. In the wake of the war, with the enforced labor and bondage of men and women against their will, they questioned, was this a free country? If the revolutionary generation could fight over their own enslavement to the policies of Great Britain, why couldn't enslaved people do the same against their masters? These contradictions were evident in the debate over the ratification of the Constitution and would foment the struggle over the supremacy of the Constitution as a law of the land. From the beginning, the Constitution was a document of compromises. To secure ratification, the founders made several deals in an attempt to please all the competing voices from the states. But this was especially true regarding slavery. The delegates worked hard to tailor their language to remove any references to slavery from the final document, including the usage of the word slave. However, slavery, slaves, and slave masters were accounted for in several places. Article 1, Section 2 contains the three-fifths clause, detailing how to count, or not count, individuals for representation. By accepting free persons and those bound to service in the national census, while rejecting all Indians not taxed and only partially counting all other persons, a euphemism for slaves, the founders sought to satisfy Southern states, and particularly Virginia, by boosting the representation for these states in Congress. In giving Southern states more representation than their mostly free white population numbers would amount to, the delegates sought to secure the Southern states' votes for ratification. Some Southern delegates had threatened to reject the Constitution because they feared Northern states, some of which had begun to end slavery, might make a national law abolishing slavery. This fear was related to the concern of a central national power imposing laws on the states, restricting states' ability to self-govern and decide their own laws and traditions one of the hallmarks of federalism. Since Northern states were abolishing slavery, what would prevent them from imposing their traditions on the South in a national law passed by a central legislature? To be clear, many Southerners in the late 1700s believed slavery would eventually die out. However, few of them wanted to bring the system to an immediate end. Most Southerners, including leading men like Washington, Madison, and Jefferson, all of whom owned slaves, thought the end of slavery was eminent and inevitable. Yet none worked at the convention or afterwards to make that happen. Slavery occupied much of the discussion at the convention. And one belief that slavery would cease was accounted for in Article 1, Section 9. In this part of the Constitution, the delegates detailed tax revenue for, revenues for states based on the census and determined by the three-fifths clause. This sought to create that balance of any perceived Southern gains. More importantly, however, the importation of slaves from outside the United States was to be halted by 1808. However, the domestic slave trade could continue. 
As an aside, I will note here that it is a result of a legal end of the international slave trade, not an actual end. Americans' domestic trading would increase, contributing to the continuation rather than the end of slavery, as had been hoped. Nonetheless, at the time, ending the trade but not slavery fit within the prevailing notions that slavery was not compatible with democracy and would naturally end. So while this would satisfy some delegates, it would have dire consequences for the future. In addition to these slavery provisions to secure ratification, the final draft of the Constitution froze the conversation about national abolition for the next 20 years. In Article 5, just prior to establishing the law of the land in Article 6, the founders prohibited any amendment or change to the Constitution which would end slavery before 1808, the year when the slave trade was to stop. Again, this would only prolong the argument, contributing to more conflict over slavery and deepening the rift between the states. As northern states creeped slowly towards abolition, the southern states held firmly to the system of chattel slavery of African men and women. I wanna pause here for a moment to note a historian's word of caution. It's often very easy for us today, with all the hindsight of historical knowledge, to judge the founders for their inability to end slavery and not foresee the coming storm. Or, spoiler alert, as I tell my students, the coming civil war. Part of the problem of living in any age is the inability to predict the future. There were many Americans who predicted slavery would end eventually, while others believed slavery was part of the natural order of human existence. There were people who speculated that slavery could and would lead to future conflict. They would be proven right, but it was possible in 1787 that they might have been wrong. At the time of the Constitution's creation, no one could have known how the events would play out. There were so many possible outcomes. Nothing was decided, and yet everything was possible. No one could know what would come next. Yes, the founders should have ended slavery. And yes, they could have. This is the evaluation that we hold today because we're not 18th century people. We are a product of the events that did happen, and this shades our evaluations. We know there will be great bloodshed over these compromises. We know that there was a time when different choices could have prevented this bloodshed. They were a product of their time and did not know the Civil War would come. They worked within the parameters they understood for their time, and this led to a constitution of compromise, of practical solutions to their problems at the moment with only some regard for what might come next. The Constitution was the establishment of basic laws and procedures, not a plan for a high moral code enshrined in a powerful, mystical, and sacred text which would come to be revered by generations of Americans. Therefore, having developed this series of concessions over the practice of slavery, the delegates had given in to the various factions. They'd tried to navigate the traditions and beliefs of regional identities, and they set the stage for future conflict and disunity. While the Constitution stated it was the law of the land, slavery would become one divisive issue among many, leading to conflict over whether this Constitution was really supreme. Over the years, Americans would debate whether the national laws superseded the laws of the states. In the early Republic, it remained unclear how this idea would be enforced. The landmark case in 1803, in Marbury versus Madison, the supremacy of the Constitution is affirmed by the Supreme Court. This case, which established the principle of judicial review, is fascinating in its own right and requires much deeper evaluation than we can give it tonight for the time that we have allotted. But it's important to our story. Since Chief Justice John Marshall's decision became the first time the Supreme Court overturned a lower court ruling and solidifying the supremacy of the court as the arbiter of the Constitution. This will dictate a precedence, placing federal power supreme over the state. This decision came at a time when states had been challenging the idea of a sovereign federal power. In the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, published in 1798, 
Madison and Jefferson debated the enforceability of the Adams administration's Alien and Sedition Acts. The necessity of these acts has been debated over the years with historians vacillating between the acts as being necessary at the time for security to a contention that the acts were a gross overstep of a despotic power. For context, Adams was a member of the Federalist Party, promoting the ideas of a strong central government, and the party was asserting that they were holding on to the proper interpretation of the Constitution. During Adams' term as president, the party had hoped to increase the power of the federal government over the states to develop a more stable and united nation. The Alien and Sedition Acts, passed during the quasi-war with France, did censor members of the rival party. The Federalist Party's rationale centered on their need to silence the critics of President Adams and their party in order to maintain support for the policies enacted against France. However, this only served to highlight the grave concerns held by their opponents, the Democratic Republicans. They, on the other hand, tended to support friendly relationships with France and a less powerful central government. They saw the policies of Adams as overstepping the bounds and limits imposed by the Constitution in the Bill of Rights. The fears of a tyrant oppressing the people had come to fruition. Adams was another king, restricting freedom with the support of a despotic central government. And thus the divide grew over the balance between the central and local authorities. Political identities would center on one's belief in the amount of power the government should wield. Published anonymously at the time, these two essays spoke against oppressive central government, a fear of the revolutionary generation. In the Kentucky Resolution, Jefferson asserted that the states had the right to invalidate federal laws which infringed on the rights of the people and were unconstitutional. Speaking against the Alien and Sedition Act specifically, Jefferson's essay was the most forceful of the two. His debate focused on the idea that the states formed the central government in a compact, and therefore the states had the unquestionable right to judge of its, the central government's, infraction. The states, according to Jefferson, were the arbiters of the Constitution. Therefore, when the federal government creates a law which is unconstitutional, a nullification by the states is the rightful remedy. While these protests hinged primarily on the belief that individual civil liberties like freedom of press and speech were being violated in the Alien and Sedition Acts, the two publications would later lead to broader debates about states' rights, nullification, and secession. So while Marbury's the Marbury decision sanctioned the power of the federal government to fill court seats explicitly, it also indirectly addressed the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions claims that the states could refuse to obey federal law. Marshall's decision in Marbury did not end the debate over supremacy once and for all. Marbury may have been decided in 1803, but it would take many years and many more cases before the people would accept federal supremacy. 19th century Americans would continue to test whether the federal government could make laws enforceable in the entire nation or if states could reject these federal laws. After the resolutions, the doctrine of states' rights would dominate the conversations over the supremacy of the central government and the Constitution. Long a feature of American culture, states' rights asserts that there is a separation between the authority of the state and the authority of the central government. Under the principle of states' rights, great autonomy is given to the states with less restrictions coming from the central powers. Unlike the later divides in the 20th and 21st century, 19th century states' rights was not a function of a specific political party or of conservatism over liberalism. Instead, the idea was espoused by various groups in reactionary ways to situations that they were confronting. Arguments espousing states' rights were often practical and pragmatic, crossing party and regional lines. Then as now, Americans' concept of when the state and when the federal government should step in can be situational. Most 19th century debates centered more on economic issues of trade, taxes, and tariffs 
and less on what we refer to today as civil rights. Based in the belief that regional authorities are better equipped to solve local problems, as well as preserve the local traditions, states' rights dominated the political conversation as the northern and southern states began to grow further apart. And this was primarily over slavery as the 19th century progressed. Although issues had been ongoing, in the 1830s, the arguments about states' rights would reach new heights. Two examples highlighting the contestation of federal and state supremacy, neither of which are directly related to slavery, can be found in the Supreme Court case of Worcester versus Georgia and the nullification crisis. Both events demonstrate the precarious line between state and federal power in the antebellum world. In Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court ruled against the state of Georgia, asserting federal power as supreme. Again, this is a complicated case and it deserves more analysis than we have time to give it. But it's important because it helps to illustrate the prevailing opinion on states' rights at this time and the complexities of supremacy. Samuel Worcester was a white man and a Christian missionary living among the Cherokee. The state of Georgia sued Worcester for breaking Georgia law, restricting white persons from living among the Cherokee. The state of Georgia had recently passed this law in response to men like Worcester living on Cherokee land and assisting tribal leaders in resisting Georgia laws that attempted to override land treaties between the United States government and the Cherokee. It's important to state that Worcester had Cherokee permission to live within their boundaries. So while he was found guilty of breaking Georgia law, he was not breaking Cherokee law. It was a case ripe with state and federal conflict. Georgia's lower court decision found Worcester guilty and sentenced him to hard labor. However, when the case came to the Supreme Court, Marshall, who was still Chief Justice nearly 30 years after the Marbury case, wrote the majority decision overturning Worcester's conviction. The laws of Georgia were found unconstitutional. Article 6 of the Constitution gives the United States government the ability to make treaties with sovereign nations. And the Cherokee were a sovereign nation. Since the Cherokee had treaties with the U.S. government, giving them the rights to their land, they had the authority to determine who lived within their holdings. Therefore, if the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, also in Article 6, then the state of Georgia had no right to make a law that infringed on Cherokee territory. As Marshall writes, the Cherokee Nation then is a distinct community occupying its own territory in which the laws of Georgia can have no force and which the citizens of Georgia have no right to enter but with the assent of the Cherokees themselves or in conformity with treaties and with the acts of Congress. The whole intercourse between the United States and this nation is by our constitution and laws vested in the government of the United States. In his majority decision, Marshall reaffirmed the supremacy of the United States government under the constitution, continuing the precedents set by the Marbury case. However, the story does not end tidily with a win for Worcester, the Cherokee, or federal supremacy. Despite the Constitution and the Supreme Court's decision and Marshall's song dis defense of federal supremacy, the state of Georgia refused to free Worcester and refused to back down on their attempts to legislate, legislate over the Cherokee Nation. Instead, this case becomes the prime example for us of the Constitution being the law of the land until it isn't. The court may have utilized the process of judicial review and found that the state had overstepped the Constitution, but the power of the court stopped there. The system of checks and balances left Worcester and the Cherokee Nation the winners of the case. But the court could not enforce the law or protect the people. This was, and still is, a job for the executive branch. At the time, the president was Andrew Jackson, a man who was not known to be sympathetic to native peoples. In 1818, Jackson had previously fought the Seminole, driving them out of US territory, crossing into Spanish Florida, sparking an international incident, and nearly causing war with Britain. In 
As a military commander and later president, Jackson's policies further marginalized Native people and led to the removal of Indians to the West in the Trail of Tears. After Worcester versus Georgia, when Georgia refused to recognize the supremacy of the federal government's treaties with the Cherokee and the Cherokee's right to the land, Jackson, whose job it was to enforce the law, did not do so. Instead, Jackson has been reported to have said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Whether he really made this comment or not, the story is stuck because it's indicative of Jackson's disrespect for the Native peoples and his disagreement with U.S. policies protecting Native Americans. As president, Jackson knew that the Supreme Court had no authority to enforce the laws. This power is reserved to the president. And in this case, Jackson refused to enforce the laws. Article 6 had clearly defined a path for protection of Worcester and the Cherokee. Article 6 is the law of the land. The Constitution requires enforcement to actually be the law. How did this happen? Jackson was a believer in states' rights. He had campaigned for the presidency on a state's rights platform, calling for less centralized national power. It was not a surprise then, and it shouldn't be a surprise now, to learn that he refused to step in and enforce the law in Worcester v. Georgia, demonstrating here again for us the struggle for constitutional supremacy in this period of time. Worcester v. Georgia decided that federal treaties needed to be enforced by a president. This wasn't enforced. The Constitution is the law of the land so long as the people agree that it is and the law is enforced. In 1832, when Worcester decision was being made, the Marshall Court's finding was far from popular. Jackson, although breaking the law himself, was following through with what was the popularly held opinion at the time. The people of Georgia and elsewhere in the United States supported Jackson's view. The land of the Cherokee was valuable. It was desirable property. And in the rush for Western land, states sought to profit off of land sales and taxes. If the land was held by the Cherokee, Georgia lost out on these revenues. Therefore, the state of Georgia was viewed as being within their right as a state to control the land which the Cherokee were occupying. So while Marshall found Georgia to be breaking the Constitution, Jackson did not. This blatant refusal to enforce the law demonstrates the conflicting ideas about the supremacy and this incident would lead to later disobedience of federal law, establishing a precedence for future conflicts. Following this event, Jackson and Georgia began that process of Indian removal to free that land for white settlers and useful modern development. Again, the state triumphed over the federal, and again, most Americans agreed that Georgia was right to do so. The will of the people was the law of the land, not the Constitution. During the same time that the Worcester case was moving through the courts, another conflict over supremacy arose in the nullification crisis. Again, tonight, we will only be able to get a brief summary of a much more complicated story. Writing on behalf of his home state in South Carolina, in the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, John C. Calhoun, Jackson's vice president at the time, and also a strong advocate of states' rights, opposed an 1828 federal tax that was deemed punitive to the southern states and to southern trade. It was seen as beneficial to northern merchants. Resurrecting the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, Calhoun argued that the states had a right to veto and nullify federal laws deemed unconstitutional within the state. Using the right of interp interposition, Calhoun said that the states had the right to act as the mediator between the people and the national government. In order to arbitrate the laws, the state could step in and protect the people. This idea was based in arguments supporting the theory that states are supreme. They are best able to meet the needs of the people. However, Calhoun went a step further than Madison and Jefferson had and threatened that secession from the Union was an acceptable option. According to Calhoun and other proponents of nullification, only the states could protect the people. Only the states could step in against a tyrannical government. 
and therefore the states had a right to withdraw from the compact to do so. This controversy would lead to bitter arguments within Jackson's administration, contributing to a showdown between the two men, and eventually through a series of public and scandalous events, Calhoun will resign as vice president in 1832, only to come back to Washington as the state senator from South Carolina to continue to thwart Jackson, and then to press the claims of nullification for the next two decades. In the case of nullification, Jackson took the opposite direction and enforced federal law, upholding and defending federal supremacy. Jackson, despite his state's rights stance, saw that nullification was a threat to the stability and unity of the United States. Had South Carolina been permitted to void the tariff of 1828, then what would have stopped other states from refusing to economically contribute to the nation? If South Carolina seceded from the United States, would the United States cease to exist? Could this lead to civil war? Jackson's worries of disunity in civil war led him to fight with Calhoun and enforce the tariff and the subsequent compromise tariffs designed to maintain the union rather than allow nullification to turn into secession. In nullification, we can recognize that the compromises that had built the Constitution were as fragile and delicate four decades later as they had been at the founding. Nullification embodied the belief that states were supreme. Americans in the 1830s were still debating the proper role of the federal over the state in matters of power, just as they had been in the 1780s and 90s. And while Jackson did not compromise on federal supremacy during the nullification crisis, his treatment of native peoples shows us the ways in which Americans held complicated and contradictory views about federal power. Jackson's reaction shows us that supremacy can both be accepted and rejected at nearly the exact same time. So while Jackson asserted federal supremacy and nullification, he rejected it when applied to the Cherokee land holdings and governmental treaties. Thus, if Jackson held contradictory views, it is no wonder that most Americans were divided over supremacy. It should not surprise us that many people were able to hold views over the role of the Constitution in the debate about slavery. In the antebellum debates over nullification, the initial crisis began with a tariff. But the ideas, as Calhoun championed them until his death in 1850, soon came to include the debate over slavery. Within the growing population of states' rights advocates in the South, the ability to maintain control would mean the ability to reject a possible federal law that might abolish slavery. Nullification became one theory to cling to in order to protect slavery where it already existed. The end consequence for nullifiers was secession. And while this was not the first time states had threatened secession, Abolitionists in the North and slave owners in the South became more vocal and more radicalized. Secession became a looming and existential crisis to the Union and the Constitution. From the 1830s until the coming Civil War in 1861, Americans argued about the role of the federal and state government in the continuation, maintenance, and elimination of slavery. As discussed previously, the Constitution was not exactly silent about slavery, but it didn't create a clear path for the federal government to deal with the system of chattel slavery either. The vague language and lack of direction left the debates open to interpretation, which split the anti-slavery and pro-slavery factions. According to some abolitionists who were themselves greatly divided over the minutia found within the debates over slavery, the Constitution was an illegal document. And while he rightly noted the Constitution was a compromise between slavery and freedom, William Lloyd Garrison asserted the document was a pact with the devil, going so far as to publicly burn a copy of the Constitution in protest as a pro-slavery document in 1854. Garrison would advocate that the North should secede in order to protect liberty and freedom. Solidifying this interpretation of the Constitution as a pro-slavery text was Article V's requirement for the return of property 
including human property. However, other abolitionists would claim that the lack of explicit language proved the Constitution was an anti-slavery document, which could be used to advocate for emancipation. Citing the preamble's use of the word, we the people, this was used to argue that everyone was a citizen incorporated under this moniker. This, of course, was a radical thing for the time, since we the people would include women as well, a shocking proposition which might lead to female suffrage. Eventually, these debates would be overridden by a Supreme Court ruling, which would be even more divisive over slavery. It's more divisive than definitive about the supremacy of the Constitution as the law of the land as well. In the 1857 ruling, Dred Scott versus Sanford, there was a break in any chance at reconciliation. In the majority decision handed down by Chief Justice Roger Taney, the court ruled that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. This 1820 piece of compromise legislation had prohibited the spread of slavery into the territories added through the Louisiana Purchase. Asserting that slaves were property under the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment, Taney stated that Dred Scott, a slave suing for freedom under the premise that he was taken into territories where slavery was illegal, had no right to freedom or to bring a lawsuit since he was property. Furthermore, Taney claimed that blacks had no rights of protection under the Constitution because they couldn't be citizens. In essence, this decision would give the ability to protect the practice of slavery to the states, affirming states' rights. However, it also proclaimed the principles found in prior court precedents that stated the Supreme Court was the arbiter of the federal laws. Finally, in a staggering blow to abolitionists and the enslaved, Taney stated the federal government could not ban the spread of slavery into the territories based on the rights of property ownership contained in the Constitution. This stunning decision could, would change the direction of the fight to end slavery. Once the Constitution was used to protect the spread of slavery, many questioned a state's ability to outlaw slavery within their borders. What would stop slave owners from moving into the states that had already abolished slavery? This was a question that led many who had only been lukewarm about abolition to become more involved in trying to find a legal means to end the practice. I wish I could tell you that this led to moral and righteous indignation, but it didn't. Good and caring people didn't necessarily step up and say, let's end slavery. Unfortunately, the development of the free soil and Republican parties, while they did attract those morally opposed to slavery, were built by white laborers who feared an influx of black slaves competing for jobs. Again, the historians caution to us of reading the past through our present eyes, we have to think that in their world, it was different. Enter into our story a relatively unknown Western lawyer whose ambition led him to a term in Congress, a failed senatorial run, and a long shot campaign for president. Abraham Lincoln was far from an abolitionist in 1860, but he did have moral issues with slavery. His moral compunctions did not overrule his understandings of the Constitution as a document which protected slavery, a point he affirmed in his first inaugural address. Speaking to the entire country, Lincoln promised the South that he believed in the Compromise Constitution and that he, as president, had no legal right or ability to emancipate the slaves. He would not do so. The Union must be preserved. The North and the South must work together to preserve the Constitution. Yet even Lincoln knew he was on shaky ground. Prior debates had argued that there was no law and no language in the Constitution to compel states to remain against their will. Lincoln would try to reimagine the Constitution, but how could he prevent the Union from breaking up and appeal to both sides? Could he do it? No. While Lincoln and members of his cabinet would seek to develop new compromises, the states of the South would secede. And by April of 1861, the nation was at war. Lincoln would be at war with the Constitution 
Over the next four years, Lincoln would expand the boundaries of the traditional and restrictive interpretations of the Constitution's limits, including interpretations he himself had once believed in and supported. As modern Americans, we fall into a cult of Lincoln. We see the mythology of the heroic Lincoln over the realities of the human being. During his administration, Lincoln would break the laws of the United States and overstep the boundaries of the Constitution as much as he possibly could within his readings at the time. Most famously, he would advocate censorship and suspend the writ of habeas corpus, and then refusing to comply with the Supreme Court ruling in ex parte Merriman. He would enact martial law to return the South to the Union, a process permitted nowhere in the Constitution at the, to the readings at the time. Finally, through the use of executive order, Lincoln would circumvent Congress in direct defiance of Article I, outlining the role of the legislature. And while we laud the moral outcome of the Emancipation Proclamation today, at the time, Lincoln was on shaky constitutional authority to do so. Lincoln, in the course of the Civil War, reimagined the Constitution. By breaking the law and going against the Constitution, Americans would be able to conceive of liberty and equality in new ways. It created the sacred moral text we revere 150 years later. This leads us to some of the final thoughts I wish to share tonight. With the end of the Civil War, the Constitution was no longer the same document. While much of the original words remained and still remain today, the interpretations once held about compromise and balance between diverse factions no longer were part of how Americans would read this text. Lincoln's disregard for the Constitution and the law of the land were part of an ongoing contest over the supremacy of the federal government. During the expediencies of war, laws were ignored and broken, and this was done in the name of unity. But it also fundamentally changed America. Certainly the Reconstruction Amendments, which would change our notions of citizenship, contributed to the shift as well. But it was also the rhetoric of a moral American struggle between right and wrong, good and evil, that defined and redefined the meaning of the Constitution. The document gained a higher purpose as the focus shifted from a practical guide for keeping order to the protection of rights enumerated in the amendments. Previously, the Bill of Rights had been applied as a buffer between the people and the states. Hereafter, it would be used more broadly between the people and the states, between the people and the federal, and then the people and the states, sorry. It would take key cases like Gideon versus Wainwright and Tinker v. Des Moines in the 20th century to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. But this change was coming. The implications of these events would stretch into the 20th century and beyond. Although the Civil War led to the crushing of widespread dissent over the supremacy of the federal government, in a thousand other ways, local protests still roiled under the surface. In the 20th century, many of the conflicts that spawned the civil rights movement were based on the conflicts that came out of the contested powers of state and federal. The people questioned whether the federal government could step in and force the states to integrate lunch counters, public transportation, and schools. And while state legislatures passed and enforced local laws rooted in discriminatory practices, when federal powers stepped in and enforced federal legislation in opposition to these laws, constitutional protections were upheld. So while local political elites sought to continue to hold local power under the guise of states' rights, the notion of federal supremacy developed under the Lincoln administration's new birth of freedom. It created a new understanding of the Constitution's power, scope, and meaning. And this concept would soon take precedence. The overturning of Plessy versus Ferguson's separate but equal ruling in, the, in Brown could not have happened without the steady work done by countless reformers who sought to instill new ideas of the new reading of the Constitution. It's not a practical document of compromise to ensure stability and unity out of the revolution, but a moral compass of human rights born out of tragic losses in the Civil War. However, before we pat ourselves on the back and think our work is done, we should remind ourselves that this reading is still contested.
The moral interpretation of the Constitution as a protector of civil liberties is always developing. Challenges to the supremacy of federal laws are ongoing. How we read federal supremacy and how the input of the people and the democratic ideal are construed is still not stable. Think of all the ways the state and federal government are still in opposition today. To better understand this, I rely on an analogy used by political scientists to describe the complicated mess of shared powers. Picture a layer cake. On the surface, we tend to think of the separation of the state and the federal as neatly and clearly delineated positions. There's the cake. There's the frosting. We can see the federal power. We can see the state power. They are perhaps overlapping. They are in proximity to one another, but they are separated. There's a structure. Each is related, supporting, complementary. This is how we like to imagine state and federal powers being divided. But like all our human experiences, it's far from neat and tidy. Instead, it's not a layer cake. We should visualize a marble cake. The layers are gone. The divisions are a mess. It's part state, it's part federal, all at the same time. Hopefully it still is tasty, but it's harder to tell which is which when you consume it. It's both at the same time. And this is how we should consider the complicated nature of the division between the two. As the constitution has been enforced and not enforced over the years, we've established a sense of precedence and tradition which helps us to hold those contradictory beliefs about the separation of state and federal authority. Just as the founders held contradictory beliefs about slavery and the role of government intervention in the workings of the state, we hold contradictory views about laws, policies, and procedures today. By way of some final examples, I ask you to consider the current conflicts which states have with the federal government and where they are at odds today. This is a judgment-free zone. I do not bring these up to enforce a view of the right way or the wrong way to interpret these current challenges. But the fact that these challenges still exist is instructive to our conversation tonight. Consider, there are state laws permitting legalized marijuana usage. We are embroiled over debates on abortion, gun control, school curriculums, gender identity and same-sex relationships. The protests over COVID-19 restrictions have endured for over two years. And we have yet to find agreement over immigration policies. This list could be longer and is far from inclusive. Yet I think each example helps us understand how complex our world is, how complex the founders world was, and how we struggle as they did to compromise to build a nation out of these many voices. Despite the founders' decision to assert the Constitution is the law of the land, there have always been challenges and incidents in which Americans chose not to follow the law. And perhaps the Constitution was never really the law of the land, despite its assertion in Article 6. It was and is sometimes the law of the land. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you tonight. Are there any questions? Oh, we do have one question. Um, how, what has been the role of the Supreme Court in this debate? Particularly, there are two ways that are approaching interpreting the Constitution. Those who see the Constitution as a living document subject to change, mm -hmm. and those who try to look back to the general original intent of the founders. How has that played into this whole issue of the federal, the Constitution being the supreme law of the land? I think for both factions, everyone wants the Constitution to have clear cut and very definable answers to that question. And the problem of this Constitution that we have is that it is so broad that it is in some ways that living document that can be applied at any time to any sort of situation. But when we have those conflicts and we believe in a way that may um, challenge us to think new ways for the existing time period that we're living in, that we, we want that contradictory viewpoint of what we consider in some ways that 
it's a stable document, right? It speaks at all times. And again, some of the, you know, brief examples I gave at the end sort of help us understand how that can fit into that contradictory. Because if we choose any one of those topics and we'll say, well, you know, this Constitution doesn't talk about this. How can the Supreme Court even rule on these things? Because if we're thinking about what is the purpose of the Constitution and how it gives us a framework for a governmental system, that's the practical part of it. How does it then deal with all the other stuff of how do we make new laws? How do we negotiate and navigate moving forward from here? They certainly weren't talking about some of the issues that concern us today, right? because they didn't exist for them. And so how do we then make it, as I'm sure you guys will talk in future lectures, right, about elasticity and um, how we mold and shape our opinions over time. I don't know if that was the best answer, but it's definitely a good question to think about how do we make those sort of really contradictory choices when we're looking at that? Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Last time someone asked me about uh, any further reading suggestions, so I did um, put a couple of those in today for you. So these are some readings that might uh, help think a little bit further about what I talked about today. <laughs>